Jesus and his love. Number 196, tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to a to tell. There's another one that's very similar to that. Um, tell me the story of Jesus. Do you know the number of that one? Let's go to that one. Tell me the story of Jesus. It's um, 153? 52. 52. 152. All right. I was just saying, tonight is story time, so that's why we're singing about stories tonight. I can tell you about when, when I was a little boy, Friday nights were often story time in our home. We'd uh, gather in the living room, sometimes with our uh, bathrobes and pajamas on, and gather close to mom and dad, and mother or dad would read a story to us, or tell us a story. Usually it was read a story. Tell me the tell me the story of Jesus. <clears throat> tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Peace. 
send good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert. I think we're going to stop there. There's not many of us singing, but uh, it, all of us who are here are, and I hope somebody out there is singing with us. But uh, we want to share a story that's a little bit longer tonight, and so uh, we're going to get started here a little earlier. So let's uh, bow together as we begin with prayer. Shall we kneel? Father in heaven, as we bow together in prayer here this evening, we are reminded of the old, old story of Jesus and his love, of how he came to this earth. And uh, we know that there's so many who've never heard that story. So many. And yet, you're soon to come again, the second time, for those who know you and are ready for you and are looking for you. And so we pray that you would help us, that we might share that story simply and give you the glory and the praise for what you've done in the past and what you're soon going to do as you come again. We pray and thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. While Rumiko's coming up, I'll just share a little bit about this story. This is kind of an allegory. It's not really uh, anything that I can put my finger on and say, this happened at such and such a time or to such and such a person. But it's the story of some kids who didn't know about Jesus or anything about his life and what he did for us and how he came so many years ago. And as you hear the story, as you relate to it, you can perhaps think of the many, many in this world who've never heard the story of Jesus and how he came to this earth. My wife Rumiko grew up not knowing the story of Jesus. Christmas time was not even a holiday in her country of Japan. Uh, maybe they got a piece of cake or something and... Uh, Maybe they had some, some decorations around the town that reminded them of a holiday, but it was not related to, uh, to Jesus particularly. So, Rumiko, what would you add to that? What was Christmas like to you? <clears throat> Christmas is a family time. 
and expecting a nice big decorate cake to eat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to start with this story. It's called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. And uh, I'm going to start out reading. Some of it we'll read, some of it we'll try to tell. It's 80 pages, so we can't begin to tell that in the, in the 40 minutes that we have here tonight. But we're going to try and pick out what may be the most significant parts of it. What, this, this is somewhat humorous in places, as you'll see. So don't, don't be afraid to smile a little bit. The Hardimans were absolutely the worst kids in the history of the world. They lied and stole and smoked cigars, even the girls, and talked dirty and hit little kids and cussed their teachers and took the name of the Lord in vain and set fire to Fred Shoemaker's old broken-down tool house. The tool house burned right down to the ground, and I think that surprised even the Hardeman kids. They set fire to the thing, and, uh, and they were setting fire to all kinds of other things all the time. But that was the first time that they managed to build a, burn a building down, a whole building. I guess it was an accident. I don't suppose I woke up that morning and said, we're going to go down and burn Fred Shoemaker's tool shed. But maybe they did. Anyway, after all, it was a Saturday and not much was going on. It was a terrific fire. Two engines and two police cars and all the volunteer firemen and five dozen donuts sent up from the tasty lunch diner. The donuts were supposed to be for the firemen. But by the time they got the fire out, the donuts were all gone. The Hardeman kids got them. What they couldn't eat, they stuffed in their pockets and down the front of their shirts. You could actually see the donuts all around Ole Hardeman's middle. I couldn't understand why the Hardemans were hanging around the scene of their crime. Everybody knew the whole thing was their fault, and you'd think they'd have been the first ones to get out of sight. One fireman even collared Claude Hardeman and said, Did you kids start this fire smoking cigars in that tool house? But Claude just said, we weren't smoking cigars, and they weren't. They were playing with Leroy Hardeman's young Einstein chemistry set, which he stole from the hardware store, and that was how they started the fire. Leroy said so. We mixed all the little powders together, he said, and poured lighter fluid around them and set fire to the, with the, to the lighter fluid. We wanted to see if the chemistry set was any good. Any other kids, even mean kids, would have been a little bit worried if he'd stole 495 worth of something and then burned down a building with it. But Leroy was just mad because the chemistry set got burned up along with everything else before he had a chance to make one or two bombs. The fire chief got us all together. There were 15 or 20 kids standing around watching the fire and gave us a little talk about playing with matches and gasoline and dangerous things like that. I don't say that... That's what happened here, he said. I don't know what happened here, but that could have been it. And you see the result. So let this be a good lesson to you boys and girls. Of course, it was a great lesson to the Hardemans. They learned that wherever there's a fire, there will be free donuts sooner or later. I guess things would have been different if they'd burned down, say, the Second Presbyterian Church instead of the tool house. But the tool house... <clears throat> was about to fall down anyway. All the neighbors <clears throat> had pestered Mr. Shoemaker to do something about it before. <coughs> Go ahead. Because it looked so awful and was sure to bring rats. So everybody said the fire was a blessing in disguise. And even Mr. Shoemaker said it was, it was a relief. My father said it was the only good thing the Hardamons ever did. And if they, they would known it was a good thing, they wouldn't have done it at all. They would have set fire to something else or somebody. They were just so all around awful you could hardly believe they were real. Ralph, Imogen, Leroy, Cloud, Oli, and Gladys, six skinny, stringy-haired kids, all alike except for being different sizes and having different black and blue places where they had cranked each other. 
They lived over a garage at the bottom of Sproul Hill. Nobody used the garage anymore, but the Hadamans used to bang the door up and down just as fast as they could and try to squash one another. That was the idea of a game. Where the other people had grass in their front, where other people had grass in their front yard, the Hadamans had the rocks. And where other people had the hydrangea bushes, the Hadamans had the poison ivy. <laughs> there was also a sign in the yard that said, Be, beware of the cat. New kids always laughed about that till they got a look at that cat. It was the meanest looking animal they'd ever seen. It had one short leg and a broken tail, one missing eye, and the mailman wouldn't deliver anything to Hardiman's because of it. I don't think it's a regular cat at all, the mailman told my father. I think those kids went up to the hills and caught themselves a bobcat. Oh, I don't think you can tame a wild bobcat, my father said. I'm sure you can't, said the mailman. They never tried to tame it. They just tried to make it meaner and wilder than it was to begin with. If that was their plan, it worked. The cat would attack anything it could see out of its one eye. One day, Claude Hardiman emptied the first class grade, the whole first class grade, in three minutes flat when he took the cat to a show and tell. He didn't feed it for two days and it was already mad. And then he carried it to the school in a box and when he opened the box, the cat shot out right straight up in the air, people said. It came down on top of blackboard ledges, clawed four great big long scratches all the way down the blackboard. Then it just tore around all over the place, scratching little kids and shedding, shredding fur, scattering books and papers everywhere. <clears throat> the teacher, Mrs. Brandle, yelled for everybody to run out in the hall, and she pulled a coat over her head and grabbed a broom and tried to corner the cat. But of course, she couldn't see with the coat over her head, so she just ran up and down the Isles hollering, here kitty, smacking the broom down whenever the cat hissed back. She knocked over the happy family dollhouse and the globe of the world and broke the aquarium full of 20 gallons of water and about 65 goldfish. All the time she kept yelling for Claude to come and, to come and catch his cat. But Claude had gone out into the hall with the rest of the class. Later when Mrs. Brando was slapping band-aids on everybody who could show any blood, she asked Claude why in the world he didn't come and get his cat under control. You told us to go out in the hall, Claude said, just as if he were the ordinary kid of, of a first grade classroom who did whatever the teacher said to do. The cat settled down a little bit once it got something to eat, mostly of the goldfish and Ramona Billion's two pet mice that she had brought for show and tell. Ramona cried and cried on and carried on so much, she said, I can't even bury them. They finally just sent her home. The room was a wreck, broken glass, paper and books and puddles of water and dead goldfish everywhere. Miss Brando was sort of a wreck too and most of the first graders were hysterical. So, so somebody took them outdoors and let them have recess for the rest of the day. Claude took the cat home and after that there was a rule that you couldn't bring anything alive to show and tell. Parents. Go ahead. Now, well, you can tell what kind of kids they are. And uh, <coughs> so, how about parents? What now, kind of home did they come from now? Yeah. Now and then you see Mrs. Hardeman walking the cat on the leash of chain around the brook, but she walked double shifts at the shoe factory and wasn't home much. <clears throat> My mother friend's Miss Philip was a social service worker and she tried to get some welfare money for the Hardemans, so Mrs. Hardeman could just work one shift and spend more time with her children. <coughs> but Mrs. Hardeman wouldn't do it. She liked the work, she said. It's not the work, Miss Fripp told my mother, and it's not the money. It's just that she'd rather be at the shoe factory than shut up at home with that crowd of kids, she sighed. I can't say I blame her. So the Hardamon pretty much locked after themselves, Ralph, 
looked after Imogen, and Imogen looked after Leroy, Leroy looked after Cloud, and so on down the line. The Hadamo were like most big families. The big one taught the little ones everything they knew. And the proof of that was that the meanest Hadamo of all was Cloudy, the youngest. Gladys. Gladys. We feared they were headed straight for hell. By the way, by way of the state penitent penitentiary? Penitentiary. Until they got themselves mixed up with the church and my mother and our Christmas pageant. And that's just the introduction to, to let you see what kind of kids these were, these Hardeman kids. The problem was the lady who was in charge in the church of the kitchen pageant fell and broke her leg. And so um, the girl's mother, the one that's writing the story, her mother took over the Christmas pageant and had to put it all together. And so uh, the, the lady, Mrs. Armstrong, who'd slipped and broken her leg from the hospital, called her up every day, sometimes several times a day, trying to tell her exactly how the pageant should be run. And uh, of course, this this was something that had been done the same every year and the same routine and the, even the same kids basically doing the same parts of the program. So things are about to change. Go ahead. Where? I don't know. 18. So when their mother got, got the responsibility of the Christmas pageant, here's what happened. Our Christmas pageant isn't what you'd call four-star entertainment. Mrs. Armstrong's breaking her leg was the only unexpected thing that ever happened to it. The script is standard. The inn, the stable, the shepherds, the star, and so are the costumes, and so is the eating, or the casting, I mean. Uh, primary kids are angels. Intermediate kids are shepherds. Big boys are wise men. Elmer Hopkins, the minister's son, has always been Joseph for as long as I can remember. And my friend Alice Wendelkin is Mary because she's so smart, so neat and clean, and most of all, so holy looking. All the rest of us are the angel choir lined up according to height because nobody can sing parts. As a matter of fact, nobody can sing. We strictly are a no-talent outfit except for a girl named Alberta who whistles. Last year, Alberta whistled, What Child Is This? for a change of pace. But nobody liked it, especially Miss Bottles, because Alberta put too much into it and ran out of air, passed out cold on the manger in the middle of the third verse. Anyway, that shows you how routine this pageant was. But here is where things begin to change. Nobody could have thought that the Hardemans would have any connection with the Christmas pageant. Most of us spent all week in school being pounded and poked and pushed around by the Hardemans, and we looked forward to Sunday as a real day of rest. Once a month, the whole Sunday school would go to church for the first 15 minutes of the service and do something special, sing a song or act out a parable or recite Bible verses. Usually the little kids sang Jesus Loves Me, which was all they were up to. But when my, mother, when my brother Charlie was in with the little kids, his teacher thought up of something different to do. She had everyone write down on a piece of paper what they liked best about Sunday school or draw a picture of what they liked. And when we all got in church, she stood us up front in the congregation and said, Today some of our youngest boys and girls are going to tell you what Sunday school means to them. Betsy, what do you have on your paper? Betsy Cathright stood up and said, what I like best about Sunday school is the good feeling I get when I go there. I don't think she wrote that down at all, but it sounded terrific, of course. One kid said he liked hearing all the Bible stories. Another kid said, I like learning songs about Jesus. Eight or nine little kids stood up and said what they liked, and it was always something good about Jesus or God or cheerful friends or the nice teacher. Finally, the teacher said, I think we have time for one more. Charlie, what can you tell us about Sunday school? My little brother, Charlie, stood up, and he didn't even have to look at his paper. What I like best about Sunday school, he said, is that there aren't any Hardemans here. Well, the teacher should have stuck with Jesus Loves Me because somebody 
Everybody forgot all the nice churchy things the other kids had said and just remembered what Charlie had said about the Hardimans. When we went to pick him up after church, his teacher told us, I'm sure there are many things that Charlie likes about Sunday school. Maybe he will tell you what some of them are. She smiled at all of us, but you could tell she was really mad. On the way home, I asked Cherry, what are th- some of the other things you like that she was uh, talking about? She sh- he shrugged. I like all the other stuff, but she said to write down what I like the best. And I, what I like the best is no hard ones. Not a very Christmas sentiment, my father said. Maybe not, but it's a very practical one, mother told him. Last year, Charlie had spent the whole second grade being black and blue because he had to sit next to really Hardeman. Okay. In the end, it was Charlie's fault that the Hardeman showed up in church. For three days in a row, Leroy Hardeman stole the dessert from Charlie's lunch box, and finally, finally Charlie gave up trying to do anything about it. Oh, go on and take it, he said. I don't care. I get all the dessert I want in Sunday school. Leroy wanted to know more about that. What kind of dessert, he said. Chocolate cake, Charlie told him, and candy bars and cookies and Kool-Aid. We get refreshments all the time. All we want. You're a liar, Leroy said. Leroy was right. We got jelly beans at Easter and punch and cookies on on Children's Day, and that was it. We get ice cream too, Charlie went on, and donuts and popcorn balls, and who gives it all to you, Leroy wanted to know. The minister, Charlie said. He didn't know what else to say. Of course, that was the wrong thing to tell Hardimans. If you wanted them to be, to, to stay away from any place, and sure enough, the very next Sunday, there they were, slouching into Sunday school, eyes peeled for the refreshments. They didn't find any refreshments, but they found something else. They, they, had, uh, they had an announcement there. Okay. We'll be starting rehearsal soon for Christmas pageant, he said. And next week after the service, we'll all gather in the back of the church to decide who will play the main roles. But of course, we want every boy and girls in our son school to take part in the pageant. So be sure your parents know that you will be staying a little later next Sunday. Mr. Mr. Cruddy made his same speech every year, so he didn't get any wild applause. Besides, as I said, we all knew what part we are we were going to play anyway. Alice Wenderkin must be must have been a little bit worried. Though she, because she turned around to me with sticky smile on her face and said, I hope you are going to be in the angel choir again. You are so good in angel choir. What she meant was, I hope you won't get to be married just because your mother's running a pageant. Well, she didn't have to worry. I didn't want to be married. I didn't want to be in the angel choir for that matter, but everybody had to do something. All of a sudden... Emma Jean Hardiman dug me in the ribs with her elbow. She has the sharpest elbows of anybody I ever knew. What's the pageant, she said. It's a play, I said. And for the first time that day, except when she saw the collection basket, Emma Jean looked interested. All the Hardimans are big moviegoers, though they never pay their own way. And uh, they fight, they start a fight, and then they slip in quietly and... and, uh, they can't even be caught. So uh, here they are in church hearing this announcement about the pageant and wondering what that's all about. Go ahead. Where's the way? 28. Now, this isn't going to take very long, mother told us. My father had said it better not take it very long because he wanted to watch the oh this is not wanted to watch the football game, go home early. But uh, anyway, they were going to choose people to be in the in the pageant. 
And so uh, she was telling a little bit about how the lineup was going to be, much as it had always been. Uh, little children in cradle row would be angels, and the older kids would be shepherds, and some of the oldest and biggest boys would be uh, wise men and so on. Uh, and then they, then they would need a Mary and a Joseph and three wise men and the angel of the Lord that spoke to the shepherds. These aren't hard parts, they said, she said, but they're important parts. So the, these people must absolutely come every rehearsal. And they had a bunch of questions about what happens if we get sick and things like that. We'll skip over and find out what, uh, what it means to be a part of, um, of this Christmas pageant with the Hardeman kids. Let's let's see how let's see how they uh, how they pick their parts. Someone suggested that that uh, the Reverend Hopkins' son would be Joseph. Elmer told him he didn't want to be Joseph. I feel dumb being up there, and uh, I. Nobody's ever going to uh, notice me anyway since I said the same thing last year. But somebody will turn up. I'll bet he didn't think that that somebody would be Ralph Hardeman. All right, Mother said, Ralph will be our Joseph. Now does anyone want to volunteer to be Mary? Mother looked all around trying to catch somebody's eye, anybody's eye. Janet, Roberta, Alice, don't you want to do to volunteer again this year? No, Alice said, so low you could hardly hear her. I don't want to. Nobody volunteered to be wise men either, except Leroy, Claude, and Oli Hardeman. So there was my mother, stuck with a Christmas pageant full of Hardemans in the main role. There was one Hardeman left. Oh, Back earlier, she, Emma Jean had volunteered to be uh, to be the Mary, to be Mary, the mother of Jesus, and that was a surprise because Alice, the the girl that had always been it, she was the most holy look girl. Yeah. But Emma Jean said to her, "If you take the Mary role, I put the pussy willow in your ear, and then way down in the ear." And then next spring, the pussy will grow from ear. So your whole life, you have a pussy will growing from your ears. So everybody refused to take the part, and all Hardaman kids took the part. We're trying to move faster than we had planned because the time is going by so quick. And we're uh, Maybe can just not even ha about halfway through. Where are we? This was the first rehearsal, the first time they came together. And here are, uh, are the, all the kids together, and the Hardeman kids are all there in the middle, smiling and happy and interested in what's going to happen. They wanted to know who were the shepherds when Mother said uh, all the little kids would be shepherds and the, and the kindergarten ones would be angels. What are the shepherds, Leroy Hardeman wanted to know. Where do they come from? And uh, he, Ole Hardeman didn't even know what a shepherd was. Or anyway, that's what he said. What was the inn, Cla Claude wanted to know. What's an inn? It's kind of like a motel, somebody told him, where people go to spend the night. What people? Claude said, Jesus. Oh, honestly, Jesus wasn't even born yet. How could he go to the mo motel? Why, Ralph asked, what happened first? Emma Jean hollered at my mother. She was talking about Mary and Joseph going to the, going to the inn and not being allowed to come into the inn and having to go to the, to the stable. Why, Ralph asked. Well, Emma Jean hollered at my mother, begin at the beginning and tell us the whole story. They didn't know a thing about what was happening. That really scared me because the beginning started in the book of Genesis where it says in the beginning. And if we were going to have to go way back there, we'd never get through. Can I go through? 
Okay, go ahead. You find a place. And so they practice, but then the Imogen showed so interested the Bible. She never went to the library, and then she asked the girl and her, how can I, how she can get the library, and so she found the book and the Bible and start reading by herself and study about the Jesus. And uh, the day, anyway, and then there's a charity box and there's a food in a box. And one of the kids took the big ham to home. But they study about the Bible and Jesus. And then the same the day, the hustle or the the Christmas pageant they came and uh, I was let's just go, let's just read this one. maybe this one, this, one this, this is the this is last kind of part. the last part the, the story of the Christmas pageant before they'd gone through all kinds of amazing uh, experiences with these kids trying to figure out what what the story of Jesus was all about and how it all fit together I mean, there were, they ended up with a fire truck out there because one of them was smoking in the bathroom and, and they called the fire department. And uh, the, the ladies burned all of their applesauce cake in the, in, in, the, in the kitchen. And then here it was finally the night of the pageant. We didn't have any supper that night because uh, their mother was so busy. While? While we... I mean, that's right in the middle. We might be right. Nothing seemed very different from the pageants of other years at first. There was the usual big mess all over the place, baby angels poking their eyes out uh, with other baby wings and grumpy shepherds stumbling over their bathrobes and the spotlight swooped back and forth and up and down till it made you sick in your stomach to look at it. And as usual, whoever was playing the piano pitched away in a manger so high we could hardly hear it, let alone sing it. My father says away in a manger always starts out sounding like a closet full of mice. But everything settled down, and at 7.30 the pageant began. Okay. While we sang away in a manger, the usher lit candles all around the church, and the spotlight came onto the star. So you really had to know the word to away in a manger because you couldn't see anything, not even Alice Wenderkin's bustling eyelid. After that, we sang two verses, O Little Town of Bethlehem, and then we were supposed to hum some more, O Little Town of Bethlehem, while Mary and Joseph came in from a side door. Only they didn't come right away, so we hummed and hummed and hummed, which is boring and also very hard, and before long, doesn't sound like any song at all, more like an old refrigerator. I knew something like this would happen, Alice Wenderkin whispered to me. They didn't come at all. We won't have any Mary and Joseph, and now what are we supposed to do? I guess we would have gone on humming till we all turned blue, but we didn't have to. Ralph and Imogen were there all night, only for once, they didn't come through the door pushing each other out of the way. They just stood there for a minute as if they weren't sure they were in the right place. Because of the candles, I guess, and the church being full of people, they looked like the people you see on the six o'clock news, refugees sent to wait in some strange, ugly place with all their boxes and sacks around them. It suddenly occurred to me that this was just the way it must have been for the first real holy family stuck away in a barn by people who didn't much care what happened to them. They couldn't have been very neat and tidy either, but more like Mary and Joseph, Imogene's veil was cockeyed as usual and Ralph's hair stuck out all around his ears. Imogene had the baby doll, but she wasn't carrying it the way she was supposed to, cradled in her arms, she had it slung up over her shoulder, and before she put it in the manger, she thumped it on the back twice. 
I heard Alice gasp, and she poked me. That isn't a very nice thing to burp the baby Jesus, she whispered, as if he had colic. Then she poked me again. Do you suppose he could have had colic? I said, I didn't know why not. I didn't. I didn't. He could have had colic or been fussy or hungry like any other baby. After all, that was the whole point of Jesus, that he didn't come down on a cloud like something out of the amazing comics, but that, that he was born and lived a real person. Right away we had to sing while shepherds watched their flocks by night. And we had to sing very loud because there were more shepherds than there were anything else. And they made so much noise, banging their crooks around like a lot of hockey sticks. Next came Gladys from behind the angel choir, pushing people out of the way and stepping on everyone's feet. Since Gladys was the only one in the pageant who had anything to say, she made the most of it. Hey, unto you a child is born, she hollered, as if it was for sure that the best news in the world. And all the shepherds trembled and sore afraid of Gladys, mainly, but it looked good anyway. Then came three carols about angels. It took that long to get the angels in because they were all primary kids and they got nervous and cried and forgot where they were supposed to go and bent their wings in the door and things like that. We got a little rest then while a boy sang, We Three Kings of Orient Are, and everybody in the audience shifted around to watch the wise men March up the aisle. What have they got? Iris whispered. I didn't know, but whatever it was, it was heavy. Rilo almost dropped it. He didn't have his frankincense jar either, and Cloud and Oli didn't have anything, although they were supposed to bring the gold and mar. I knew this would happen, Iris said for the second time. I bet it's something awful. Like what? Like a burnt offering. You know the he- Hardemans, well, they did, burn, they did burn things, but they hadn't burned this yet. It was a ham, and right away I knew where it came from. My father was on the church charitable work committee. They gave away food ba- baskets at Christmas, and this was the Hardemans food basket ham. It still had a ribbon around it saying, Merry, Merry Christmas. I bet they stole that, I said. They didn't. It came from their food basket, and if they want to give away their own ham, I guess they can do it. But if, even if the Hadamas didn't like ham, they had never before in their lives given anything away except rumps of the head. So you had to be impressed. Leroy dropped the ham in front of the manger. It looked funny to see a ham there instead of the fancy bath salts jar we always used for the myrrh and the frank incense. And then they went and sat down in the only space that was left. While we sang, what child is this? The wise men were supposed to confer among themselves and then leave by a different door, so everyone would understand that they were going home another way. But the Hardeman forgot, so didn't or didn't want to or something, because they didn't confer and they didn't leave either. They just sat there and there wasn't anything anyone could do about it. They're ruining the whole thing, Alice whispered. But they weren't at all. As a matter of fact, it made perfect sense for the wise men to sit down and rest, and I said so. They're supposed to have come a long way. You wouldn't expect them to just show up and hand over the ham and leave. As for the running, ruining the whole thing, it seemed to me that the Hardemans had improved the pageant a lot just by doing what came naturally, like burping the baby, for instance, or thinking a ham would make a better present than a lot of perfumed oil. Usually by the time we sang Silent Night, which was always the last carol, I was fed up with the whole thing and couldn't wait for it to be over. But I didn't feel that way this time. I almost wished for the pageant to go on with the Hardemans in charge to see what else they could do or would do that was different. Maybe the wise men would tell Mary about their problem with Harold, and she would tell them to go back and lie their head off, or Joseph might go with them and get rid of Harold once and for all, or Joseph and Mary might ask the wise men to take the Christ child 
wisdom, figuring that no one would think to look for. I was so busy planning new ways to save the baby Jesus that I missed the beginning of a silent night, but it was all right, all night, all right, because everyone sang silent night, including the audience. We sang all the verses too, and when we got to song, song of God, Love's Pure Light, I happened to look at Imogen, and I almost dropped my hymn book on a baby angel. Everyone had been waiting all this time for the Hardimans to do something absolutely unexpected. And sure enough, that was what was happening. Emma Jean Hardiman was crying. In the candlelight, her face was all shiny with tears, and she didn't even bother to wipe them away. She just sat there, awful, cold Emma Jean, in her crookedly veil, crying and crying and crying. Well, it was the best Christmas present we ever had. Everybody said so, but nobody seems to know why. When it was over, it was over people stood around the lobby of the church talking about what was different this year. There was something special, everyone said. They couldn't put their finger on what. Mrs. Winderkin said, Well, Mary, the mother of Jesus, had a black eye. That was something special, but only what you might accept, she added. She, mean, she meant that it was the most natural thing in the world for the Hardaman to have a black eye. But actually, nobody hit Imogen, and she didn't hit anyone else. Her eye wasn't really black, either just all puffy and swollen. She had walked into the corner of the choir robe cabinet in a kind of those days, as if she had just caught on to the idea of God and one of Christmas. And this was the funny thing about it all. For years I'd thought about the wonder of Christmas and the mystery of Jesus' birth and never really understood it. But now, because of the Hardimans, it didn't seem so mysterious after all. When Emma Jean had asked me what the pageant was about, I told her it was about Jesus. But that was just part of it. It was about a new baby and his mother and father who were in a lot of trouble. No money, no place to go, no doctors, nobody they knew. And then arriving from the east, like my uncle from New Jersey, some rich friends. But Emma Jean, I guess, didn't see it that way. Christmas just came over her all at once, like a case of chills and fever. And so she was crying and walking into the furniture. Okay, that's good. Afterward, there were candy cane and little tiny testament for everyone, and a poinsettia plant for my mother from the whole Sunday school. We put the costume away and folded up the crop sub of my manger, and just before we left, my father snuffed out the last of the tall white candles. I guess that's everything, he said as we, stored, as we um, stood at the back of the church. All over now, it was quite a pageant. Then he looked at my mother. What's that you've got? It's the ham, she said. They wouldn't take it back. They wouldn't take any candy either, or any of the little Bibles. But Emma Jean did ask for a set of the Bible story pictures, and she took out the picture of Mary and said it was exactly right whatever that means. I think it meant that no matter how she herself was, Emma Jean liked the idea of the Mary in the picture, all pink and white and pure looking, as if she never washed the dishes or cooked supper or did anything at all except have Jesus on Christmas Eve. But as far as I'm concerned, Mary is always going to be, is always going to look a little bit like Emma Jean Hardiman sort of nervous and bewildered, but ready to clobber anyone who laid a hand on her baby. And the wise men are always going to be Leroy and his brother, bearing ham. When we came out of the church that night, it was cold and clear, with crunchy snow underfoot and bright stars overhead. And I thought about the angel of the Lord, Gladys, with her skinny legs and her dirty sneakers sticking out from under her robe 
yelling at all of us everywhere, Hey, unto you a child is born. And I want to share that from Jezebel Ages. Heaven and earth are no wider apart today than when Shepherd listened to the angel song. Humanity is still as much the object of heaven's solitude as when common men of common occupations met angel at noonday and talked with the heavenly messengers in the vineyard and the field. To us, in the common walks of life, heaven may be a very near angel from court above we attain the steps of those who come to come who come and go at God's command. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for Son of God to take man's nature, but Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by four thousand years of sin. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. To meet a bitter conflict and a more fearful risk, God gave his only begotten Son that the path of life might be made sure for little ones. Here is in love is love. Thank you. So there you have the story of the best Christmas pageant ever. Best why? Because some who never knew heard the story for the first time and it changed their lives. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as we close tonight, we want to think and let our minds dwell just a few moments on the marvelous, wonderful gift of Jesus to this world. And there are so many who have never heard, so many who don't know about a love like that. And Lord, as we contemplate the story of these children who, who came from a home where they never knew and yet had the opportunity in a simple way to be introduced to the story of Jesus. We pray that we might also have the opportunity to share with others who may not know the wonderful story of Jesus and his love, how he came to this earth, how he lived and died, and how he's coming again soon. We pray that this might be our opportunity and our privilege, and we pray and thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen.